If you got your Bibles, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 4 today. Peter's audience was going to experience difficulties in their Christian walk, uh, just like every Christian in every generation. We looked at the scriptures that let us know that after the Messiah came, that the Messiah would be a refiner's fire for the church, that the Messiah would be a fuller's soap to cleanse the church, uh, that the church would go through difficult times, different eras, different generations are going to experience different kinds of difficulty. And to be honest, uh, before this year, uh, I didn't really, I couldn't imagine America going through a difficulty. I always thought it would be third world countries and undeveloped countries that would suffer the worst persecutions. Uh, countries with dictator, dictatorial governments would suffer the worst persecutions. Communist countries uh, would suffer the worst persecutions. But America, America was founded on Christian principles. It's a Christian nation. And, uh, we really haven't had to go through the things that other countries have had to suffer until this year, and I think we're getting a little taste uh, of it. So what we're going to be looking at, Peter has been a real encouragement for us, and what he comes to at this part of the text is he's going to exhort the elders to realize that most of the congregation are sheep. People can get nervous, people can get afraid, people can get depressed and so he tells the elders now is going to be a time for you to rise up and tend to the flock shepherd the flock look out at your sheep and see who's doing good look out at the sheep and see if one of them happens to be wandering off and so he exhorts the elders at this point in the text watch your flock and take care of them so let's look at it today <clears throat> first peter chapter 5 verses 1 through 4 So I exhort the elders amongst you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you do, and not for shameful gain, but eagerly not domineering over those in your charge, but being an example to the flock. And then when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. I love this text. The background to the eldership, I want to trace this uh, back a little ways to open up the reality for what a remarkable position the eldership is, uh, how established the eldership was in Jewish days in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament, the high respect and regard that goes with this position. It can be traced all the way back to Jewish times. Uh, the first time we see this eldership pop up in Scripture is when Moses was leading uh, the Israelites in the Exodus out of Egypt and Moses is in the wilderness, and Moses is the guy that the Spirit of God had rested upon to lead my people out of Egypt. And once they were in the wilderness for a period of time, Moses had to do all of the judging and the deciding between cases and figuring out how to get things done. And we've uh, already estimated that there were over a million people out in that wilderness. The Bible says there were about 600,000 men and if there were 600,000 men, they didn't count women and children. So there were over a million people that Moses was having to lead. And Moses finally one day goes to God and, God and says, God, this is too much for me. There's too many people. I can't manage all of them. So God sees the wisdom in this and he says, well, go out and pick 70 men. And those 70 men, I will put my spirit on those 70 men so that they can help you lead the congregation so that they can help you lead Egypt. These were 70 elders. The office of the elder 
became a permanent fixture in the leadership of Israel. Uh, it's the oldest office in the church uh, in the scriptures. Elders became a permanent fixture. Uh, the elders pop up all over uh, as being crucial in the Old Testament when Elijah was being chased and persecuted. Elijah surrounded himself with the elders to decide what they must do. When the kings had difficulties, uh, remember in particular King Ahab was being threatened by the Syrians and King Ahab surrounded himself by the elders to figure out what he should do. Every village had its elders and the elders would sit at the city gate so that if there was ever a problem within the village, the villagers knew to go out to the city gate and take it to the elders and they would decide the cases for the people. This was carried over into the New Testament. We see it as early as when Paul was going on his very first missionary journey. Paul's first missionary journey uh, Acts 14, he goes out and he, he establishes elders in all the congregations. Uh, Paul leaves Titus in Crete and he tells Titus in the book of Titus, Titus, here's the qualifications and I want you to set up elders in the churches while I'm gone. And the elders were the center of everything in that time. When, when Paul, on his third missionary journey, when he went back around to all the churches to collect the offering for the poor and suffering in Jerusalem. That was the third missionary journey. Paul went around and took all that money as he collected all the way around. And when he came back to Jerusalem, he called together the elders. As a matter of fact, before he left Ephesus, before he left Ephesus, he called all the elders together and they prayed. And he said that he was concerned that the Holy Spirit was telling him that when he returned to Jerusalem, there would be difficulties and imprisonment waiting for him. And so you remember there in Athens, Paul and all the elders cried when Paul left them. When Paul got to Jerusalem, he called together the elders there and he gave all the money that he had collected for the poor people to the elders. And they were the ones that distributed it throughout the church, throughout the flock, as everyone had need. So a crucial office. I want to give you this little quote from uh, uh, William Barclay. When people enter the eldership, there's no small honor being conferred upon them, for they are entering the oldest religious office in the world, whose history can be traced throughout Christianity and Judaism for 4,000 years and no small responsibility falls upon them, for they have been ordained shepherds of the flock of God and defenders of the faith. I just love that introduction because it is uh, impressive. It's, uh, it's, it's a magnificent office. And so let's get into Peter's first verse here. Let's remember that the church is going through a lot of difficulty. He's encouraging them to be like Jesus. You're going to face persecution. You're going to face opposition. When you have uh, the Spirit teaching you spiritual truths with spiritual words, carnal man cannot understand the things that the Spirit teaches the church. And so when you share your faith with people, when you live out your Christianity in your community, you should expect a difficulty because you have been given spiritual insights that carnal people cannot understand. And so in the midst of this, Peter is equipping the church to say, be like Jesus. Uh, what was the scripture? I want to say Isaiah 34, but that's probably wrong. Uh, Jesus uh, said that he was going to obey God and that he would not turn his back. And understanding the persecution that was before him, he made his face like flint. Jesus, uh, do we call that? Uh, we don't advocate stoicism, but does anybody know the word stoic? He became stoic. Uh, I don't think that philosophy is the right philosophy, but what it means is set yourself, roll up your sleeves, embrace yourself for what's coming. And that's what Jesus did. 
And so he's urging the elders, boy, you're going to want to keep your people uh, encouraged, braced, motivated for what it is that they're about to go through. So, 1 Peter 5, 1, I exhort the elders amongst you as a fellow elder, as a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed. Uh, the first thing I gravitated towards in this text is that Paul, I mean, Peter calls himself a fellow elder. So Peter was serving in this office of shepherding God's sheep. And he says, as a fellow elder, and so there was some consolation in the fact that Peter is able to call himself a fellow elder because if we look back on Jesus' passion, Peter was a guy that messed up quite a bit, wasn't he? Peter was impetuous. He spoke sometimes before he thought. Uh, yeah, Peter had a difficult time. Um, but in the end, Jesus continued to work with Peter, continued to mold him, continued to help him. Unfortunately, right up to the passion to Jesus' death, uh, Peter probably made the biggest mistake. Peter said, he took out his sword and he said, Jesus, we're not going to let anybody hurt you. And Jesus got upset at him for that because Jesus said, how am I going to fulfill Isaiah 53? How am I going to fulfill the suffering servant? I have to go be ridiculed, beat, spit upon, tortured, and I have to die. That's what the prophet said. Peter, aren't you aware of this? You're in the way of what God wants me to do by saying we're not going to let anything happen to you. So he put Peter in his place. But look at this. Peter was willing to defend Christ as long as he got to do it brazenly, boldly, with macho and a sword. But the minute Jesus says, that's not the way we do battle. That's not the way we fight. Jesus told Pilate, uh, if my kingdom was of this earth, my disciples would fight to stop you from doing this to me. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this earth, so we don't do battle in the earthly way with swords and fists. We do battle in the spiritual way. So my, my people are not going to fight for me. And so Peter wanted to stand up for Jesus if he got to be Rambo. But if he had to be humble and meek, and let people abuse him when he didn't deserve it, Peter wasn't ready for that. So he denies Christ three times. We know from the text, Jesus looks at him on the third denial, the cock crowed. What, what must Peter have felt like in that moment? So Peter had fallen down on the game. He had made his mistakes. And yet what is beautiful about this is that Jesus didn't give up on Peter. Jesus didn't give up on Peter. And uh, to add insult to injury, after all of this, Peter says, well, that was fun while it lasted, uh, I guess. And then here we've got this little verse, John 21. Simon Peter says, well, I guess we'll just go fishing. Don't we do that sometimes when things don't work out the way we planned, when we don't really make sense of what's going on? We just kind of want to revert back to something that we're comfortable with. We kind of want to go back to some place where we've got a little bit of uh, foundation so we don't feel so shaken up. And Peter, after he had denied Christ, uh, even though he had seen him resurrected, he says, well, I guess the game is over. I'm just going to go back fishing. But look at what the rest of the sentence says. Simon Peter told them, I'm going to go fishing. And whoever was with Peter, the disciples said, hey, we'll go with you. So they went out and they got in the boat and they didn't catch anything. That's what God does when he's unhappy with you. He lets you go fishing, but you don't catch any fish, apparently. <laughs> but uh, what's interesting about this text is... What's interesting about this text is uh, whatever Peter wanted to do, notice that there were some sheep following him. The other disciples that were with him just followed along with him. I think that's a very telltale kind of a thing. And so uh, Peter says that he now, though, had matured. He had experienced 
Christ's forgiveness, and this is what I want to bring us to, uh, how was Peter conferred the office of eldership? Well, at that same fishing trip, Jesus appears on the beach, calls him in. We'll remember the story. Peter saw him, tied his clothes around his waist, jumped in the water, and swam back to the shore. Jesus forgives Peter. One of the most beautiful texts probably in Scripture. Jesus forgives Peter. He lets him know, hey, apparently this is part of your growing process, Peter. You failed a couple of times, but God's not done with you, Peter. And so he tells him, Peter, and here's the phrase, Peter, do you love me? You've messed up and you probably feel guilty and you probably feel unworthy. You probably feel really, really small right now. But let, let, me, let me build you up a little bit, Peter. Do you love me? Because if you love me, there's something I need you to do. He says three different times, I should share this with you, uh, three different times when Peter looks at, when Jesus looks at Peter and he says, Peter, if you love me, and he uses these uh, three phrases, bosque, he says, bosque my sheep. Uh, this means take care of my sheep, Peter. Uh, take care of them. Normally the text says, feed my sheep. But there's more involved. It is shepherding. The word means shepherd my sheep. Do whatever it is that they need. It's more than just feeding. Feed them. But she Peter, do Peter, do you love me? He uses a different phrase the second time. Poi poi uh, Look after my sheep. Look out and see if there's any strays. But these people that have followed you into the boat to go fishing with you, look out and see if any of them are missing. <clears throat> Look after my sheep. And then the third time, he uses the word bosque again, the same one. Peter, do you love me? Here's what you can do for me. If you really love me, I'm going to have to go, but I want you to take care of my sheep. Shepherd my sheep is what he tells Peter here. Shepherd my sheep. And the reason I love looking at that is because that is exactly the phrase that Peter is now giving to the elders in verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God. The same words that Jesus spoke to Peter. Shepherd my sheep, Peter. Peter is now exhorting those that will come after him, passing down the tradition. Shepherd the flock of God that is amongst you. Exercise oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for gain, but eagerly. Not only is this the oldest religious office in the world, but it's the office that Jesus personally commissioned to Peter to. Jesus personally requested it of Peter, and now Peter is passing it on to future men in the church. If you love me, take care of that which I love the most. Take care of my sheep. I want to go through a couple of descriptions uh, in our text about uh, the elders. Uh, I want to approach it two ways. Some negatives. So in other words, here's some negatives. Here's what you definitely don't want to do. And then some positives. Here's what you definitely do want to do. So the negative aspect first, uh, Jeremiah 50 uh, God was telling Jeremiah the prophet that he needed to go out and correct the elders at that day because in that time, the Jewish elders were depraved. They were doing very bad. Um, there was one text in the Old Testament that said it got so bad that you sell your brothers into slavery just so you could buy a pair of sandals. It got so bad that the people that were supposed to be shepherding God's flock, the people he left in charge, were just... Uh, using that position to glorify themselves and to enrich their own life, and the, the sheep were suffering and being scattered as a result of it. Let's look at a couple of these. Jeremiah 56, My people are lost sheep. The shepherds have led them astray, causing them to roam the mountains. They've wandered from mountain to hill. They've forgotten their resting place. Everybody who finds them devours them. My sheep have been made vulnerable and are being picked off one by one because the ones that God left in charge didn't love God's sheep. There was another one, uh, Ezekiel 34. 
Ezekiel 34, again, he comes down on the elders in that time. Says uh, through Ezekiel, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus saith the Lord, ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourself, should not shepherds feed the sheep, but you eat the fat. You clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat ones, but you are not feeding my sheep. He gave this analogy that in that time they were uh, profiting. Instead of feeding the sheep and, and helping the sheep, they themselves were using the sheep to give themselves brand new coats, to give themselves the best fat, the fat meat. He said, you were doing this to benefit yourself. And he says, here's what I wanted you to do, but you haven't done it. Verse 4, the weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, those strays you have not brought them back, the lost you did not go out and seek, with force and harshness you've ruled them, so they scattered because there was no shepherd. They became food for all the wild beasts, my sheep were scattered and they wandered over the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over the face of the earth and no one to search or seek for them. It's easy to see in this negative phrase exactly what God was wishing that his shepherds would do. I wish you were out seeking the ones that have strayed and have gone astray. I wish you were out looking for them. I wish you were out healing them. I wish you were out bringing back the ones that were gone. That's what I wanted to see when I looked down. And then a sobering reality in the end when Ezekiel pronounces judgment on Israel. Judgment on Israel, you're too far gone. There is now no hope. I'm going to bring in the Assyrians to destroy the upper ten tribes. And 150 years later, I'm going to bring in the Babylonians to destroy the final two tribes. Into exile you go, there's no hope for you. And the reason for that, he said, was because the elders weren't doing their job. And so I want my angel of wrath, he says, to go throughout Jerusalem. And I want judgment to fall on all the people that weren't doing their job. And he says, but I'm going to put a mark on people that hate what's happening. I'm going to put a mark on the people that want goodness, that want what's right, but the rest of them, they're going to be destroyed. And so in Ezekiel, uh, there's a very sobering word here. When you begin to go out and do this destruction, I want you to start at the sanctuary. And so these people, so they began with the elders who were before the temple. Now, you know me. There's, this isn't a form of intimidation or a scare tactic. Is it a scare tactic? I think it's at least a, a wake-up call for us that God takes his sheep very seriously. I can only imagine if you were to leave your children with a babysitter, uh, do you scrutinize the babysitter before you trust that person with your children? Are you going to hold the babysitter accountable for making sure they're fed and making sure they don't put something in their mouth that they're going to choke on. There is a love and a tenderness towards his sheep, and God left men in charge of those sheep. So I think that's a sobering idea. Let's move on to the positive. Uh, accentuate the positive. <clears throat> Was that the, the jungle book? Accentuate the positive, something, something, the negative. No, not the go. All right, that's one of those. Okay, into the positive. Uh, the chief shepherd, we're going to learn how God, what God would do for his sheep, uh, what Jesus would do for his sheep, and we'll take a look at what the positive looks like. Ezekiel 34, uh, after he's been upset with those elders that didn't do their work, God says, I'm going to come and I'm going to do the work so you can see how to do it correctly. Ezekiel 34, 11, this is what the Lord God says, Behold, I myself will come and search for my flock, and I will seek them out 
As a shepherd looks for his scattered sheep when he is among the flock, so I will look for my flock. I will rescue them from all the places to which they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. Jesus let us know that he was the good shepherd. He was the one that would come and continue the work. Matthew 18, 12, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, doesn't he leave the 99 on the mountain and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, I truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more and more than over the 99 that never went astray. So is it not the will, it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Jesus comes and calls himself the good shepherd. I'm the one that does the job the right way. John chapter 10 and verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd. The sheep are not his. So when he sees a wolf coming, he abandons the sheep, runs away, and the wolf pounces and scatters the flock. I see two main attributes of the chief shepherd and the good shepherd. Number one, I'm seeking out and going out and getting the ones that have gone astray. And number two, I'm there to meet their needs, to encourage them, to build them up, to build their faith. Two things, going out and finding the ones that are scattered and strayed, and number two, feeding their needs. And he goes on to say, I want you to do this job willingly, not under compulsion, not because you were forced into it, not because you, you found yourself accidentally in this position and now you've just kind of got to keep up with it. He said, I want you to do this job willingly, eagerly. I want you to look at this word, hekusios, hekusios. Hekusios is this word that means uh, knowingly, consciously, deliberately, deliberately engaging in an activity. Uh, this word hekusios is used in a completely different context, but I think that the context that is used helps us to understand the kind of energy that God wants to see his eldership putting into his flock. Uh, so he says, willingly. The word we're looking at is willingly. I want you to do this job willingly. Hekusias. Let me show you it in a different context, and let's see if we can understand the meaning. In Hebrews 10, he's suggesting that Christianity, uh, repentance, turning your life around, uh, means that we do not continue to engage in the same type of sinful activities that we engaged in prior to our salvation. You shouldn't be engaging in that. And so he says here in Hebrews 10, 26, if we go on sinning hekusios, deliberately, that's the same word that's being used here, that if you're going to be an elder, I want you to do it deliberately. Here he says, if you go on sinning deliberately after we receive a knowledge for the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. We can get a feel for that word deliberately, willingly, hekusios. He says, look, if you learn the truth and you've learned spiritual truths through spiritual words, and I have said that this is an abomination, if you learn the truth and I have said that this is wrong, that I hate this, that I don't like this, if you've learned the truth and you know that God thinks this is sinful, but you deliberately keep on doing something that you know is sinful, there's the power of that word. If God is training you to recognize right and wrong, but despite the training, hekusios, you deliberately, you consciously, you knowingly keep engaging in doing that. In this particular verse, there's a judgment for doing that, but I wanted to use that to see what the word hekusias is. It's a deliberate, desirous longing to engage in the office 
of shepherding God's sheep. He said, that's the way I want you to look at your office. Not a compulsion, not something that's forced on you. I want you to develop a love for doing that, which God loves to do. In fact, the phrase goes on to say, katatheon, katatheon, uh, according to God. Do this, do the shepherding just like God. Katatheon is what it means. Do the shepherding just like God would do it. Three negatives and three positives. Do it willingly, eagerly, wholeheartedly, just like God. And do it selflessly, not because you benefit, but because you're eager for other people to benefit. Verse 3, uh, another interesting phrase, not lording over people, uh, those that have been allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. You know, they say nothing teaches a man responsibility. Nothing turns a boy into a man more than raising a family. When he's responsible to his wife, when she bears him children and he now sees these children and he's responsible to these children, men will change in all kinds of ways. I have a story that I love to tell. My father uh, drank early on in his marriage. Uh, he, he even had a full-blown bar uh, in the house. I remember it, a literal bar that you could sit at with chairs and five or six rows of glass shelves with all the hard liquors a, a guy could want, mirrors in the background. It was, a cool, it was cool even as a kid, little kid. And one of my first words was to go up to the bar and to put my hands up where my dad was sitting there drinking. He had a TV at the end of the bar. And I said, up me. Was those my first words? No. Okay, might have been my first words. Up me. And when I got up on the bar with my dad, I kept reaching for his, uh, I forgot what it was. It was a tall, I think it was a Mexican drink, and it was a tall bottle that got skinny as it went towards the top, and it was a yellow liquor anyway. Had ice in it, a little tumbler. And I said, I was reaching for it. And my dad kept pushing it away, and my mom said that he came in right after that and said he was going to get rid of all the alcohol and get rid of that bar. Get it all out of the house because there's no way he's going to let his little son sit at a bar with him and want to drink. In that instance, a boy became a man. Raising children does that for men. It forces them to rethink who they are and to become the person they need to be. Sorry, I don't, let's see. I feel like I got off track there. Let's, let's figure out where we are here. <clears throat> Those that have been allotted to your charge, you've been blessed with these people. Uh, allotted, kleros is this word, kleros. I want to tell you the word that they've been allotted to you is this word, kleros. Now, this is a fascinating word. I want to show you how it's been used in Scripture. In Matthew 27, when the soldiers, it said that the soldiers were down and they, they cast lots or they rolled dice to see who would get Jesus' garment. The, the garment that was one solid piece, the soldiers cast lots, but the word is kleros. The soldiers were gambling, to, in, in essence, to see who would be the lucky one to get this allotment. Uh, <clears throat> in Acts 26, when the disciples had to replace Judas, it said that they cast lots. It was the roll of the dice to see who, who would get it, and the word is kleros. There's this important little vacancy, this important little position, and you're going to get it completely by chance, kleros, to get a small group of something completely by chance. That's what means allotted to your charge, kleros. In Colossians, he said, Colossians 1, we should give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in an inheritance. But the word is kleros. Uh, this little portion of heaven that we're going to get to have, uh, it was just given to us. We couldn't have earned it. We couldn't have taken it. It's just here it is. It's kind of falling in your lap. That's what this idea of kleros means. So it means that you've been given this small, precious thing. The soldiers wanted Jesus' robe. Uh, the apostles wanted someone to replace Judas. 
the Christians had this little inheritance, and this is what he tells the eldership. He said, you've been allotted, you've been kleros. It's almost like the dice were rolled, and you were the, just the, the lucky one that ended up with a few people that God has given you to take care of. That impresses me because it's like, wow, God. Wow. Your gift. It was just a random, here they are. Here is these people. You're, these are your allotments. And then God says, watch over them. Shepherd them. Uh, it's frequent that men uh, will tend to feel sometimes inadequate and sometimes not up to the task. I enjoyed going over Peter's failures because despite Peter's failures, Jesus and God was still able to work with Peter and they were able to turn that boy into an elder. Uh, I want to give you an example of what I call, or what I heard in a sermon once is, you've been shown favor, so take that position. And let me tell you what that means. I was encouraged by this. When I was out uh, playing guitar around town as my full-time living, I all, often felt inadequate because I knew the other guitar players around town, and when I would get hired to play a certain venue that the other guitar players wanted to play, but I was called to come play, I got anxious because I thought, there's other guitar players that are better. Uh, are you sure? I mean, uh, really? Do you... Uh, It was feelings of inadequacy. And I heard a sermon one time that said, well, who knows why? It was just an allotment. It was just a roll of the dice. Who knows why? But you ended up being the one they called. You were shown favor. Now, you may think somebody else would be better qualified. There's other better people. Other guys could do the job better. Why me? But the fact is, you were the one called so you're the one that goes and plays. And I used to have to just remember feeding myself that for whatever reason. You may think you're not up to it, so, but somebody thought you were up to it. So go play, do your best. You've been shown favor, so go and do your job, irregardless of what you think you're going to have a tough job because you're going to be the one full of the Spirit, full of spiritual truths that were taught to you by spiritual words. And sometimes when you go chasing after uh, the sheep that are straying and you use spiritual words, carnal-minded people are not going to want to hear them. Carnal-minded people are not going to like them. But he didn't say that they had to like it, he just said, you need to do it. Go let people know what this says. My word is truth. Just let people know what it says. I'm sure it's going to be a difficult task. The chief shepherd, and then he goes on to say here in verse 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. This phrase, the idea of eternity in heaven, uh, Peter used it in the first verse. Peter says, we are going to be fellow partakers in the glory that's going to be revealed. That was in the first verse. I am an elder, I'm a fellow elder, and guess what, guys? We are the partakers in the glory that's going to be revealed. That's what he used in verse 1. And here in the close of his statement, he says, now remember that glory, uh, you're going to receive that glory, that crown of glory, when Christ comes. I love, this is what I call bookends. Uh, when the scripture tells you something, gives you some verses, and then tells you the same thing he already told you, bookends. And he says, do this knowing that you're going to inherit glory. Do this knowing that we're going to be fellow partakers of heaven. Set your mind on heaven, on that reality, 
and then do your work in the context of knowing that you are going to inherit that place right along with Peter. Uh, I think Peter is the perfect person to tell us about the glory that we're about to inherit. Because if you remember correctly, Peter, James, and John saw the glory of Christ. You remember the transfiguration, 1 Peter First uh, Peter 1 and verse 4. Uh, he's already told them about this inheritance, an, an, an inheritance that's imperishable, it's undefiled, unfading, it's being kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in that last time. As it is written, 1 Corinthians 2, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, the heart of man has not imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. I love doing this little play on words. You know, there's a popular Christian song out now. It's called, I Can Only Imagine. I Can Only Imagine. And I just kind of like to play with the words there and go, no, you can't even imagine. Scripture says we can't even imagine. What what am I going to imagine? A big, tall, beautiful mountain? A big, tall, beautiful uh, house? We can't imagine what's prepared for us over there on that other side. If you love me, shepherd my sheep, seek out the ones that are straying, take care of the ones that have been allotted to you, just a roll of the dice that God handed you this small group of people for you to watch over until he returns. Peter was an eyewitness of the glory. This is what I wanted to see. Uh, 2 Peter 1.16, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were the eyewitnesses It's amazing that we have these texts because there are so many unbelievers that will say, how can you believe the Bible? The Bible is stuff that was written hundreds of years later. It's just myths and fables that have been messed up hundreds of years later. None of the people that actually saw Jesus actually wrote anything themselves. Well, Peter is letting us know we, more than one guy, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty we saw it Luke 9 in the transfiguration 928 now about eight days after these sayings he took with him Peter John and James and he went up to the mountain to pray and as he was praying the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white behold two men were talking with him Moses and Elijah who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy in sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. Can you imagine being fully asleep and startled awake, and when you kindly come, when you finally come to you see in their full glory Elijah from the Old Testament, Moses, the original elder from the Old Testament, and Jesus shining in their glory. I can only imagine what Peter saw. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. <clears throat> Peter was a little concerned because apparently the office of shepherding the sheep brings with it a high toll. There's a high cost. And Peter started uh, considering, hmm, let me think about this here. Let me think about this whole shepherding job. And so he's honest and he asks Jesus, is it going to be worth it? There's a high toll in this shepherding job. Is it going to be worth it? Matthew chapter 19, 27. Peter said, see, we've left everything to follow you. So what will we have? 
And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left their house or their brother or their sister, father, mother, their children, or their land, for my name's sake, you will receive 100-fold, and you will inherit eternal life. Peter, a fellow elder, just had to ask, there is a big price that I have to pay to shepherd your sheep. I had to give up a lot of stuff. He listed some scary things. Family, brothers, sisters, wives, mothers, land. I had to give this up in order to do the job you've called me to. Is it going to be worth it? And Jesus said, no one who has ever sacrificed something for my sake and for the sake of my sheep you're going to get back anything you had to sacrifice a hundredfold, Jesus says. You're going to get it back a hundredfold. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart can imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. And I want to close with that same phrase. Peter, do you love me? If you love me, go out and shepherd my sheep. Go out and take care of my flock. Heavenly Father, I love the message today. We pray for our elders, Father, for the job that they've been called to do. We exalt them. We respect them, Father. We lift them up in, in your name, knowing that you have called certain people to an office that is ancient, Glorious, the, the, the most ancient office Father, not just for our elders, but that we would also have this call uh, to the sheep that we know of. This reaching out, Father, to sheep that are scattered or straying or wandering off uh, that 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 West Side as a church would be woken up this morning that the eyes of our heart would be open to see, hey, I need to reach out to somebody. There's somebody that I need to go bind up their wounds. There's someone who's hurting that I need to go encourage. There's someone who's down that I need to go lift up. Father, we want to take care of our, of our own. And we also want to reach out to the community around us. Thank you for your words that have inspired us, Father. We dedicate ourselves to your truths. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.